All right, we're back. Um, bear with me today. Today's a little bit uh, interesting in that uh, the last oh, week or so has been utter chaos. Um, first and foremost, I want to tell you guys, there's actually been a pretty crazy response. Uh, I only started this three weeks ago and uh, sharing my thoughts on the world and the Bible and Jesus's claims and, and talking through uh, my own chaos and circumstances and uh, just looking at, at life in light of the promises and, and scripture and um, Jesus's claims. Now, that being said, I've been a pastor for 10 years. I've walked with Jesus for uh, 20 years-ish, and uh, it's been chaos. It's not been a bed of roses. It's been chaos. This last week alone, i, I just share a little bit with you. Um, this last week, uh, some issues arose my wife and I had some, some argue, an argument basically that was probably um, the, lo- the biggest argument we've ever been in. And um, all having to do with PTSD triggers uh, from me and uh, moments of mental, uh, mental problems coming to the surface. Um, whether it be PTSD, or OCD that I'm dealing with, and then it, you know, it's triggered by something, and then all of a sudden my wife has anxiety and my son has OCD. So it just becomes a flood of chaos in our home. And uh, in particular, when you have those kind of circumstances, it, it's real easy to just shut everything down and crawl into a hole and forget the world exists and just be in your own head. I'm choosing to press in. There's actually a scripture in the Bible that talks about um, how our wounds turn into weapons for warfare. And it's in 2 Corinthians towards the end of the Bible. And um, it's chapter 1, verses 1 through like 11, I think it is. And it says basically the things that happened to Paul, Paul ended up getting comforted by God and that comfort with which he was comforted with, he was then able to use that as a tool or a weapon. Um, His wounds were comforted. Then he takes those wounds, turns them into a weapon and goes back and comforts other people. I'm trying to press into that. That's what I'm trying to do by these videos. And so um, today we're going to take a look at Romans 10 verses 1 through 13. Basically, what we're going to see there is that um, Paul's going to show us how following culture's direction doesn't always lead us to the right um, end, if you will. I'm going to read it real quick just so that we get an overview. And it basically says this, brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer to God concerning them, them, he's talking about the Jews at the time, is for their salvation. He says, I can testify about them. That they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge, since they are ignorant of the righteousness of God and attempted to establish their own righteousness, they have not submitted to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Since Moses writes about the righteousness that comes from the law, the one who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that comes from faith speaks like this. Do not say in your heart, who will go up into heaven, that is to bring Christ down. Or who will go down into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. On the contrary, what does it say? Right here is the claim that he gives. The message is near you, in your mouth, and in your heart. This is the message of faith that we proclaim. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. One believes with the heart resulting in righteousness and one confesses with the mouth resulting in salvation. 
For the scripture says, one, everyone who believes on him will not be put to shame. That sounds good. Since there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, because the same Lord of all richly blesses all who call upon him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So, that's our section of scripture for today. Here's the deal. I want to start with a, a kind of a question, um, if you will. If I was to give you a handwritten map today, <clears throat> and I, I gave you a handwritten map, and it was made up from 10 different people. Those 10 different people uh, wrote you this handwritten map, and it's from Seattle all the way to New York. If you tried to use that map, do you think you're going to get frustrated or lost? Probably, right? Let me ask you a different way. What if I told you um, I have a guy who has gone from Seattle to New York and multiple times, and uh, he's willing to go with you? So you have a guide, and, um, and he's been there. He's well-informed. He's got the right map. You probably wouldn't get as frustrated. You probably wouldn't get lost. As a matter of fact, you might rest along the way and enjoy it a whole lot more, right? Well, we kind of do the first one with our life. We kind of take the, the map that 10 people hand wrote and, and gave to us as our roadmap for life. And we expect it to go well. And what do I mean by that? Well, you know, social media or politics or people's opinions. We put all this circle of, of influence around us. And all of a sudden, we're picking at which one we think is or two or three or these five recipes together is going to create the perfect map for life. But that's like impulse buying. And we know how impulse buying goes, right? It, it doesn't go well, at least for me. Uh, you might be driving the very impulse by and you know that pain, right? <laughs> um, or you moved and bought the house and now it's a burden and, you know, it has more square footage, but uh, it was an impulse and you should have thought through it. Well, here's the thing. I want to challenge us to think through today um, what this claim that Jesus has and how is it, if it is, a better roadmap for life? Well, <clears throat> the first thing that he claimed was um, basically... Brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer to God concerning them is for their salvation. Let's just not miss the fact that in this case, Paul is talking to the church in Rome. And Paul's talking to them from a, a place he expresses here that is his heart's desire and prayer. So it, it wasn't just something that stayed in his heart. It actually moved him to action. So this must be serious. Anything that goes from thought to action, you actually, um, it, it's, it, it's usually serious, right? I don't go work out unless I really believe. I lost 25, 30 pounds actually now. And um, it's because I had severe health problems and mental problems. And um, quite frankly, I, I was moved to do something because this situation was dire in circumstance, right? Well, for him, his circumstances, he's saying that he wants them to have salvation. Well, here's, you know, a guy that's super concerned, actually moved to action. And why? Because these people at the time were actually living according to the set of rules, the law for works righteousness. Works righteousness. That's a lot of church words, right? So let's just, they were trying to earn their way to God or to a life that was promised to them by God. If they lived this way, he would bring peace. He would bring abundance. He would take care of them. And in some cases, they would still suffer, but he would bring joy and peace in the midst of that. So <clears throat> that sounds pretty good. I, I, I want that. Absolutely. With my own health problems and mental problems I just told you about that I can't escape in life. Or circumstances that hit me. Man, that sounds attractive. That I would at least be able to have peace and joy in the midst of that. 
Dude, last night was not peaceful and not filled with joy. And so um, my wife and I battled hard. And we talked through this morning, but when you're in the midst of the battle, what are you clinging to? Where is your hope? What's what's the joy that you're going to find um, if you look at Jesus' way? Well, he says this, and, and by the way, you know, this next part, it's so culturally relevant that if you say the Bible is not culturally, culturally relevant, you're missing it big time. You, you're not paying attention. Because right here he says, I testify about them that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. Since they are ignorant of the righteousness of God and attempting to establish their own righteousness, they have not submitted to the righteousness of God. What does that first part say? I can testify that they have a zeal for God. These guys are passionate for God, but not according to knowledge. You know what that is? That's basically someone that says, hey, man, I'm spiritual. What's your spiritualness based on? Well, uh, I kind of pulled from the buffet of religions. I meditate and I do this and I read a little bit of motivation and I do that. And that's spiritual, right? The spiritual mantra of today. Let's take the buffet of religions or practices from religions and say that that is what we believe in. That's essentially what they were doing back then. They were very spiritual people, uh, but it was surface level. If you dug into it, there was nothing there. There was an empty promise, empty hope, empty. Basically, as long as they could keep doing the rituals or practice, they were okay. But if any of those things failed, um, whether it be you know medical condition that allowed them not to do that practice. Maybe it's today, uh, part of your spirituality is running to keep mental health. Okay, well, great. But what if your you know, leg gets cancer and they have to cut it off? Well, now you got to find a whole new thing. Let's go to the buffet and figure out something new, right? Well, they were spiritual. But <clears throat> you have to ask yourself, what is behind your spirituality? What are you trusting in? Is there weight there? Is there something there behind that that can actually carry you through life's burdens, brokenness, and and, uh, trials and tribulations? I I don't know for you. I know for myself that I've tried to walk with Jesus for the past 20 years, and my life has still been filled with shambles from lost businesses to broken relationships to... Um, financial ruin to just about everything you can imagine. And before Jesus, my life was chaos. So, does spirituality hold any weight? Here, they said that they were going after righteousness by their own efforts. But it said that it wasn't according to knowledge because there was a way that was according to knowledge. That there was something they needed to know to put a basis underneath that gave weight behind their spirituality. And this is the claim. It says this, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Since Moses writes about the righteousness that's from the law, right? So he clearly in this second section Uh, The one who does these things will live by them. He puts this weight on them, and he says that their spirituality was based on a set of rules of do's and don'ts. But the problem with that is if you didn't keep those rules, you were automatically disqualified, and you were going to go, in this case, um, to hell. Well, that's missing the mark by one degree or 100 degrees. It didn't matter. Well, that's a pretty, uh, pretty important fact, right? What's interesting is, here it does say um, that you didn't have to do a bunch of gymnastics. They actually made it easier. Paul, in this case, made it easier, um, or explains it as an easier route. 
than they were already doing. How do, how do we see that? Because it says, do not say in your heart, who will go up into heaven? That is to bring Christ down. Or who will go down into the abyss? That is to bring Christ up from the dead. On the contrary, what does it say? So he's saying, you don't have to do spiritual gymnastics. You can't go to heaven and bring God down. You can't go down into the abyss and bring him up. There's nothing you can do. Huh. So if there's not something I can do, then what, what am I going to do about the spiritual element of my life? Well, here's that map and here's that guide. Okay? The next part says, the message is near you. In your mouth and in your heart. This is the message of faith that we proclaim. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. One believes, we've heard that, that part before, most of us. And if, if you're a cultural Christian, <laughs> let's say from the U.S., right? You've heard that claim before. But how about this next part where it says, one believes with the heart resulting in righteousness and one confesses with the mouth resulting in salvation. Why does he separate those two in this case? Hmm. Well, there's an important factor. Yeah. If you believe in your heart, then you're righteous. Right standing is what that means. Right standing before God. So you got to take it in. Right? That means that the part where it says confessing with your mouth, um, you don't, you can be a right standing individual as long as you believe it in your heart, which means that if you're mute, you could actually be saved. Okay? You can be right standing before God, you're good. But the other part here where it says, that if you confess with your mouth, why is he saying that we have to confess with our mouth? It results in salvation. Because what you're really confessing here is, and believe in your heart that God raised them from the dead, you'll be saved. You're confessing that I believe that when he raised from the dead, he has the ability to do the same thing for me. You're confessing that before men because you're telling them what you're putting your hope in, where your spirituality is based in. You know, there's a claim out there uh, about Buddha and Muslim, and but the problem is, is Muhammad's dead. Buddha's dead. They can't take me any further than this life. I might live a better life according to their way, but at the same time, that's only if I keep their rules, right? And when I don't, I don't feel good. I don't feel peace. I don't feel joy. But if a man died on my behalf, that's complete. That's done. It's finished. And if I believe that he raised from the dead, that he can raise me from the dead, there's a hope beyond just this life. There's a hope for this life and for the next He goes on and he says uh, in verse 11, For the scripture says, Everyone who believes on him will not be put to shame, since there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, because the same Lord of all richly blesses all who call upon him. For everyone who calls on the Lord's name will, not be, will be saved and will not be put to shame. You know... <clears throat> In that section, here's the thing. <laughs> what it's saying is clear. At the time, they understood it. The Jews and the Greeks were two groups of people that were opposed to each other big time. One was a super religious group and one was a group of people that were so far from God it was ridiculous. There was no hope. They, they basically uh, were completely apart from God without option to even um, come to know him. But what does it say there? He leveled the playing ground. 
He gave the opportunity to everyone to not be put to shame and to be saved. Both to the far from God and both to the religious keeping the rules. You know, in the same way, both people back then, churchgoers and non-churchgoers, both had the same path to Christ or to God or to heaven or to peace or to joy. Today we have the same pathway. Yet everyone's grabbing from the buffet. And nobody's satisfied. Nobody's at peace. And yes, I know. You're saying to yourself right now, well, Phil, you don't seem to have peace. You don't seem to have joy. Your wife and you just argued. Chaos ensued in your home. Mentally, you're... (laughs) Broken is really not even a strong word for that. Here's the thing. On a day-to-day basis, I have to preach the gospel to myself. What do you mean by that? Well, I have to look at those same scriptures and tell myself, today, though I failed... Though the brokenness that I've been handed, either genetically or or circumstantially, that God's bigger than my circumstances. And so I have to remind myself that he can raise me from the dead today. Just like he did 2,000 years ago. That today I can be, yes, both broken, but on a journey to healing. I can screw up with my wife, but also because he loved me enough to do something I didn't deserve, even when she fails or pulls the trigger on me um, in my PTSD, I can forgive her, she can forgive me, because we look at the image of forgiveness that we found in Jesus. That's what it means to preach the gospel to yourself in the circumstances that you're in. I want you so desperately to find that same hope. Because it doesn't just carry you through the bad days. It also carries you through the good days. On the good days, you don't go too crazy overboard either. Because on the good days, you're sitting back and saying, Hey, you know what? I, I, how are you doing? Someone may ask. And you say, better than I deserve. You're humbled by the fact that God doesn't just wipe you off the earth because you failed Once, twice, a million times. In my own life, I experience joy and peace when I center myself back on Jesus through his word. That's my goal in doing this. On a week-to-week basis, I want to share the love of Christ and how it transforms me in the midst of chaos. Look, if you found this video helpful... Man, share, please share it with other people. There are friends that are not sharing with you their deepest hurts and sorrows because they clam up. They don't feel safe sharing those things with people. But if you share this video and they can watch it in their own home, in their own privacy, it may be the very starting point for their journey to healing. If you uh, need next steps from this video i know that i'm not a church Uh, yes i was a pastor but um the reality is is this is a studio this isn't a a church where people could come and hear um, a message of hope each week but what i do want to do and by the way i don't think any church would hire me anyhow with the mental instability with all the chaos that's going on but I do believe that well-packaged sermons aren't always what people need. Sometimes people need one-on-one counseling or rawness from a pastor that's suffering from PTSD and OCD. And how are you struggling through it? And how are you walking through it? Sometimes people just need that. And so if you need that, what I do want to do is I want to link you up with someone that can help you walk day by day with that. So if you put in the comment section or message me, 
what area you're in. Um, I'll probably dialogue a little bit, but most importantly, I want to get you plugged in with someone that would be really um, a help to you on a day-to-day basis. So I want to connect you with a pastor in your area. So leave a, a name, a, a message, whatever you want, and, and I, want to, I want to talk to you, yes, but I want to plug you in with someone that can sit down and have coffee with you and just listen, be an ear, and not judge the crap out of you, but love you and point you to Jesus and preach the gospel to you so you can find hope. Thanks again for tuning in. I really appreciate you guys. By the way, I may do this every two weeks instead of every week. The reason why is because I have had an overwhelming amount of people um, in just three weeks. I had all kinds of time where I've been going back and forth with people, um, both theologically, some people, some people I've been going back and forth with uh, deep, deep hurts and pains. I've been brought into a place where I'm praying for more people, reaching more people than um, I did, honestly, even when I was a pastor on staff at a church. And so um, because of that, the dynamics of this platform may shift a little bit. It may be every two weeks. It may be every week. We're still working out some of those details. I also want to dig deep theologically a little bit more so um, and, and talk about some more detail in the nuances. So what we may do is do a series as well. Um, in the future, we may think about what subjects to do and, and what um you can do to join in on that is share with us what subjects you want to hear about. Let us know. Put it in a comment. And uh, what things do you have questions about with God? Put it in the comment. Dude, we want to hear so that we can understand how to reach you in the moment of your biggest need and question. Again, thanks for tuning in. I love you guys. And I really enjoy um, the fact that you guys are enjoying this.